Boundary Creek Big Swamp area uh, contaminates Barwon River and highlighted in 2016-17 a major fish kill occurred uh, down 30 kilometres stretch of the Barwon River that has decimated fish populations, blackfish, platypus, grayling and most species in the river. In addition, in this year being 1718, we've had yet another fish kill that is further decimating any species left in the Barwon River. What this diagram shows you that at the Colac Forest Road Bridge, this is the ground level and it goes up. But the aquifer or the deep water groundwater has a pressure head that is at this point about 18 metres higher than ground level. So what happens, the water in, under pressure in the aquifer, the lower tertiary aquifer, it finds cracks and means of ways of coming up in springs, in soaks and in, in river beds, creek, creek beds and it overflows. So basically it overflows into the system and then flows down and the pressure head is way up here. So what happens when you pump, you reduce this pressure head way down here, the streams no longer have soaks or no longer have springs or soaks or flow going into the creek because it's what the the pressure head is way down here. So you drop the pressure head and these creeks, springs, this creek here, Love's Creek will dry up as well. So you've got your pressure head here, so the springs overflow into the big swamp and pressure up, so the water's coming up all the way. You start to pump down, you pump it down that far that the pressure head down here, this is where the aquifer's full now, all the water that used to go out, any rain or whatever goes down and the same underneath the swamp. So you get, eventually get to this scenario where the aquifer has been drawn down this far, the creeks are dry, the swamp starts to dry out, the vegetation dies and then you create all the sorts of problems we'll show you later on. Near the Colac Forest Road Bridge, this is ground level, the green. The water before groundwater extraction used to to squirt into the air to this height. They did a pumping during this period and it dropped. Recovered and they did another pumping and it went down again. Did it, recovered and then the, the drought pumping, it went way down to here so the pressure head was way, the, the aquifer was way below groundwater level so Boundary Creek dries up. Uh, in, uh, in the 90s, uh, Bar and Water wanted to pump out of this particular uh, uh, site here. This is about 200 metres deep and it would take the water out of the aquifer. And back in the 90s they said if you pump 3 gigalitres, which is 3,000 million litres out of here, you will dry the Jellybrand River up. We stopped that particular development and in 2007 Bar and Water came back with a $200 million uh, program to pump 16 gigalitres, which is uh, over five times the amount of water out of this bore that uh, we knew would dry up the Jellybrand River. So that was the start of um, uh, the Lorock uh, Landcare Group because uh, everybody was quite concerned. We didn't want to see Love's Creek dry up, we didn't want to see the Jellybrand dry up. So we were warned back in the, this was back in the 90s, that if a bore field was put in here at Kawaran or Jellybrand, which is taking it out of the same aquifer. We were warned that we would finish up with a dry creek or in a dry river on the Jellybrand drying up exactly the same as the Barwon has dried up in the last few summers. In 2007, the, uh, the landholder where this site is, he said that, uh, that they, this particular $200 million development in which included land acquisition, power, roading, uh, pipelines, treatment plants and so on was going to go ahead but the initial test was going to be uh, very quiet and cause no problems. So he, um, he spoke to our, our group and uh, that's, uh, we then started to say well uh, we need to know, have a little bit more transparency about this 
and that began the campaign to stop this particular development. 2009, uh, 24 hours before going to VCAT, uh, Bar and Water pulled the pin. The government pulled the pin and they said that uh, this development's not to go ahead and it was put, put on hold. Uh, so there was no judgment made on it and the decision as to whether pumping goes ahead here or not is, is being delayed indefinitely until Bar and Water or some other water authority come out of the game. Uh, this um, $200 million development, it was designed to uh, provide water for Geelong. So part of the, pump, the pumping, uh, we, the pumping would come out, treat the water, and then it would be piped into the, uh, the Barwon River system or the Wordy Bullock Inlet Channel, which then provides water for Geelong. At one of the discussions was to implement water saving measures such as the installation of tanks on every new new house and new development and also uh, implement uh, water harvesting methods across the cities that have all these hard services that otherwise are not utilized millions and millions of litres right there that cost little or nothing to harvest yet instead we, we suck the guts out of the out of the otways water that is extracted for urban urban use is removed from this part of the environment causing problems and is never returned to this part of the environment um, once it's it's harvested and sent to Geelong the Maggio swamp um, is a very small uh, example of what Boundary Creek used to look like. You've got Melaleuca sclerosa and other species making up what is described as the swamp scrub community. And above that, you have messmate that are living on the higher, drier sites. And you've also got managums living on the moister uh, sites outside the swamp scrub community. If the uh, drying is allowed to occur in the Maggio swamp, the Melaleuca sclerosa will die along with the other species and the overstory of, of the drier species will migrate over time into that area that would otherwise be dominated by Melaleuca sclerosa. This area here, the Maggio Swamp sits on top of uh, Barongarukai. Barongarukai is one of the intake areas for the aquifers through this part of the Otways. And as you can see in the base of this little creek, which is a tributary of 10 mile creek, you can see the gravels and sands. So that in, in summer, when the, uh, when the winter flushes die down, the base, the water actually comes through those sands and gravels and feeds this little wetland and keeps it viable and uh, moist. moist. Now this is in the middle of winter and you can see the flow now. In the middle of summer, the flow is dramatically less and it takes very little groundwater extraction in this area to stop this flowing and to stop and to create a dry area where this this area in the top end slowly drying out and if it's allowed to continue all of this that we're standing in now will just disappear and it'll turn up turn turn into exactly the same type of wasteland that's over on the uh, boundary creek areas that that contain uh, burrowing crayfish need to be protected uh, the area at Boundary Creek used to have exactly the same burrowing crayfish. However, now uh, th there is no longer uh, burrowing crayfish present on that site. This tree here is a managum or Eucalyptus viminalis, and uh, you can see that the the tree has um, sections of bark chewed away. Uh, this allows uh, sap to flow out, which is then eaten by uh, 
some of the, the, the possums such as sugar gliders or yellow belly gliders that then feed on the sap and they harvest it on a nightly basis. They come out at night and they lick the sap and they keep the, the wound open to harvest, to harvest the food as a food source to survive on. Uh, this is the um, supplementary flow that is released out of the Kola Otway pipeline to uh, supplement flows in Boundary Creek. So when Boundary Creek gets down to one megalitre flows, uh, the Barwon Water by their licence for their extraction for groundwater, they have to release two megalitres of water here per day. And then that water flows into this little creek which is called Sandy Creek which is a tributary of Boundary Creek and Boundary Creek's a tributary of the Barwon River. Now what, what has happened or what happens all the time now is this two megalitres of a day is supposed to go all the way down to the bottom end of Boundary Creek so that farmers can use the water for stock and domestic. But before it gets there it disappears straight back into the ground because of the depleted aquifer that has been pumped uh, from the bore at Barwon Downs. That system is deficit of a potential of a thousand megalitres because it is being used uh, for environmental flow down Boundary Creek. They built this pipeline here to be able to pump the thousand megalitres back to Colac in times of drought. <laughs> Make sense of that. <laughs> you see these things here? I mean, we're standing in uh, the Barongarook High area and the Barongarook High area is the intake area for the rain falling on the soil or on the aquifer where it's exposed at the surface. The rain falls onto the aquifer, soaks into this ground and then provides the water that's pumped out at the bore field over at uh, Barwon Downs. Now what the reason that we're looking at this particular sand pit is because it, it shows the, the type of soil that uh, is in, in the Barongrook area. It's made up of sands, it's made up of gravels that uh, soak the water up easily and the water enters into the aquifer very easily. And we've had an enormous amount of rain over the last week or so and even in the bottom of this uh, pit here there's no sign of any water. It's obvious that the groundwater level in this particular area is way down below where that um, front end load is sitting down there. In, in the creeks and, um, creeks and swamps in this area, the pressure head used to be around about five metres up above that um, dozer down there or the front end loader. So that this, if it had have been back in the 80s, uh, this pit would have had water in it and the way in which you would have been able to extract uh, sand out of it was you would have to pump water, extract the sand and the aquifer would be continually battling the, uh, the people trying to extract the water. Like you go down to the bore field and dig a hole or put a bore in there and you put the bore and want to get water out of there the water in that bore field over at Barwon Downs would shoot up to the same height as the aquifer level here. The top of a dam doesn't have any pressure, but if you go to the bottom of a dam or the bottom of a bore field at its lowest point, it will squirt water to the top of wherever the aquifer level is. And so what we're saying here is the top of the aquifer is nowhere near here, it's even further down. Now pre-groundwater extraction, the, the top of the water or top of the aquifer used to be much, much higher. And therefore the pressure at the bore field used to squirt the water out to that height. You suck it out the Barwon Down bore field and those creeks, those springs, they stop flowing, the Barwon River stops flowing. And that's what's happened in the last few seasons, like this last summer, Barwon River was dry at Winchelsea for 90 days. Is that unusual? Yes. The Barwon River should keep flowing all the time, every day of every year.
the big swamp area is approximately seven hectares in size used to consist of a majority of Melaleuca sclerosa uh, as its major plants in the wet swamp community um, when they got burnt um, other species surrounding the swamp have migrated into the swamp including swamp gums manny gums prickly tea tree that now dominate uh, this wet swamp scrub community we have a complete change in the floristic characteristics of this site Southern Cross University guys came down and they dug six six um, inspection trench or holes across the big swamp this is number one the pH in this uh, the pH level in this was 1.9 it has elevated levels of arsenic copper zinc uh, aluminium iron cadmium did I say arsenic all those mm. all those heavy metals and it was the same right across the whole swamp this whole area is a, a, a toxic mix when you get below the, the, the top surface area of, of these um, chemicals that are then washed out into Boundary Creek. 1.9 pH, neutral, neutral is 7 and every time you go down one unit it's multiplied by 10 times so 1.9 pH is around about 10,000 to 100,000 times more acidic than neutral and we like to drink neutral water. Maggio swamp that had large Melaleuca sclerosa, sclerosa trees dominating the landscape is an example of what this used to look like prior to groundwater pumping occurring in this area. As a result, the groundwater pumping has lowered the water table in this area causing actual acid sulfate soils to occur which is then causing downstream impacts on Boundary Creek and the Barwon River. This is typical of the vegetation now growing in this area. The roots are very shallow rooted and, the, and in the next drought will mo most likely die. In this instance you can see that the roots are only uh, 300 mil deep because the toxicity of the, the soil is too toxic for the trees to grow in. The reason that the, uh, lots, of, lots of these plants live on, on the top layer of the soil, the problem's been here for ages and what's happened every time that it rains, it leaches out all the acids and heavy metals and uh, it, it then allows these plants to live on the top, top bit of soil. In other words, it's like a sponge and then it's been, been cleansed in a way but it's only, it's only skin deep as uh, was pointed out with that uh, plant before. The, uh, <clears throat> and in, in this area, the, this vegetation that you're looking at now, it has died off twice since 2010. Well, because it was too acidic. Too acidic. And then it, um, because when, during the winter, what happens is the, the, the acid and the heavy metals come up and they, uh, if they hit the, the roots, they kill the plants. Oh. And then they have to start again the next season. Well, this is the site of the 1997-98 fire and uh, the swamp below downstream of here used to be an ex extremely good nick and the top end of the swamp dried out first. As you drop the suck water out of Barwon Downs, the top end of the swamp dries out and this is where it dried out first and uh, this is where the first fire was. And uh, in, uh, since 2008, this is the first time we've seen water flowing through this particular part because it always went around to the north and uh, the possibilities it's either been blocked blocked upstream to divert through the swamp or the swamp has sunk 
because of uh, depletion of peat and it's creating a new uh, flow path. Uh, th th this is just unbelievable. Up until uh, uh, right through the millennium drought and up to uh, about 2014 this water used to be flowing around the big swamps along Boundary Creek to the north and it's not doing that at the present. It's coming, coming straight through the middle of the swamp. Uh, this side has had nothing growing on it, nothing living in it for 21 years because it's a toxic wasteland. This site has the highest elevated levels of actual acid sulphate soils in Victoria and is one of the worst actual acids contaminated sites in Victoria and that is why the community believe this site must be managed by the Environmental Protection Authority not by Bowen Water who has actually caused the problem because at the moment we've talked about what the problem is but what perhaps what we need to be talking about is um, to fix this this contaminated site what do you believe needs to occur they're going to generate several hundred years of acid and toxic metals out of this and in the short term what they've got to do is stop groundwater pumping so that the the water table comes up and that'll that'll stop that process of producing that those toxic pollutants and contaminants and the, what they have to do in the meantime is they have to treat this area to neutralize those particular acids and heavy metals oh, otherwise what do you mean treat it with more chemicals well that's a possibility or it's um uh, that that's that's for people that have done this type of work before the experts they know what to do they know how to do it they've had experiences all over australia so what bow and water has to do is get these experts in and say righto how do we look after this this is all dry land vegetation shouldn't be here if this was a swamp th those things wouldn't be alive the gums <laughs> wouldn't be in here so that's that's the top layer the next layer down is the dried peat or semi-dried peat that's producing the acid and heavy metals. Underneath that you've got another saturated layer which is benign and being locked up. When the peat's wet it's benign, it doesn't produce any toxins, it doesn't produce any contaminants. You dry it out, a different bacteria moves in and it produces acid and then the acid goes through the soil profile and produces all these toxic metals. So the way in which you've got to stop that process is to stop groundwater pumping. Stop lowering the groundwater. Stop pumping the groundwater at Barwon Downs. Nobody knows where the contact, the, the contact between this swamp and the groundwater is. And if you take What's happening, the, the water comes down, the supplementary water comes down and disappears into the swamp. So that, that's almost 100% accurate that it's directly connected to the groundwater. So it doesn't matter how much water you pour down over the winter period, it just simply goes straight into the groundwater. Because the aquifer's so because low. Because the aquifer's so low. The, um, the water that then that flows in at the Brongrook High is sucked out at this point here at the Durangameet ball field. Now if you took, if you were able to collect all the water that's been extracted out of the ground it, and started at Camperdown, you would be able to swim through that water all the way to Melbourne and it would be a metre deep and a kilometre wide. They've pumped there over 120,000 megalitres. And the thing is, there is no need to be extracting the water out of this area because the, um, the end users, they pay $5.4 million a year for a licence to keep in reserve 16 gigalitres in the Melbourne system. That's sitting there, it's paid for and it's not getting used. And in fact, when the, when the Barwon River was dry for 90 days, oh, it was actually 120 days, Barwon Water was selling some of that water to Western Water. So the farmers along the Barwon, they had no water, and yet Barwon Water had a reserve of 32 
thousand million litres and they sold five thousand million litres to Western Water. What That's a... deplorable. That's disgusting. No, absolutely no feeling, no, no uh, compassion, no empathy for the farmers who rely on the Barwon River for their stock and domestic water. It's just unbelievable. And why there hasn't been a, a, a revolt or independent, a inquiry. independent inquiry or something along those lines is beyond me. And it's, it's extremely difficult to understand why when a new suburb's put in at Geelong, why it isn't compulsory that every house, not just an optional, but every house should put in a water tank to collect water off their, their own roofs. And uh, another thing that, that our group believes is if a house gets sold in the, Ge the Greater Geelong area, a condition of this house being sold is that if there's no water tank, a water tank should be put in. And the third thing that we recommend is that every other house that doesn't have a water supply, their own water supply, that they collect off the roof, roof they be given the incentive, either a funding or they're given 10 to 20 years to get their own, their own water catchment off the roof. So that then that reduces, that reduces the demand on the water that's, that's falling out of the sky. It can stop groundwater pumping here at Charanga Meat and all the decimation that it causes can be eventually fixed up. The groundwater that has been pumped from this area is not needed by Barwon Water. Barwon Water now has the Melbourne Geelong interconnector pipe that has potentially up to 40 gigalitres of water available to Barwon Water to augment their water supply during times of drought. Once again, this site should be decommissioned. That is what the community requires and the Minister must consider this as the only practical solution to solving this major problem. Barwon River is being poisoned by contamination from the Big Swamp as a direct result of groundwater pumping. And as a result, downstream, the people of Geelong that use the Barwon River are now swimming, uh, recreating in a contaminated stream that needs to be fixed. Well, yeah. there's, there's, there's nominal monitoring of the system, but, but there's no in-depth um, good biological research to indicate the condition of the Barwon River um, apart from major events which have floating fish on, on the river indicating a fish kill. There's no investment into platypus research it, be, apart from the eDNA, we which know. is what we've initiated. We've got, we've got proof to say the Dewings Creek platypus have died out, the Boundary, the Boundary Creek platypus have died out, yep. they've, been, they've been decimated. There's absolutely no chance that they are there. As far as other stretches, we know from eDNA testing of water, we know that in the upper reaches above Boundary Creek that the platypus don't exist there. Now why they don't, we don't know. But as far as anywhere else on the, on the Barwon River, there has been no regular monitoring done that we know of. One other thing that I did want to say is that back in 2008 when we first discovered this toxic mess of acid water, high, extremely high levels of lead, extremely high levels of aluminium, iron, arsenic, uh, chromium going into the Barwon system and then flowing all the way down the Barwon into, the, into Bass Strait. We approached the EPA to, to look at this site and we said it should be a contaminated site. And they said, well, no, the EPA said, no, it's not a contaminated site. And we said, well, how do we get a designated contaminated site? And the EPA said, well, we do it. And I said, well, why aren't you see, looking at it? Because it's, an, it's not designated a contaminated site. So from 2008, they have done absolute, they have not visited the site yet. They have done nothing in the way of coordinating rehabilitation, 
looking at the site, working out what's going on there, nothing. Well, That's what, the EPA. What has to happen for the EPA to look at the site? They've, they've just got to turn their four-wheel drive on, drive in like we did today, and go and visit it. Take in some equipment, do some soil testing, do some water testing, and... Uh, talk to the locals who know what it's been like to get the history on it. But talk. isn't that their job? That is their job. When we talk about groundwater extraction being sustainable, you're talking about a balance. And the balance is where everybody gets their share of the water. And at the moment, the farmers aren't getting their share, the, the, the creeks, the springs, the soaks aren't getting their share. So that's mining. But sustainable management is where you can take out the amount, of, the amount of water that nature puts in the top of the aquifer, you can take, it, take that much out. But if you take out more than nature can put in, it becomes a mining operation and it has huge ramifications. And one of the ramifications in this particular bore field is that even though we're sitting here at the bore field and you think maybe it's just affecting this area, what it does is when you suck out the water and at this they've sucked out water down 60 meters what that creates is basically a void and then the aquifer in trying to recover sucks water in from everywhere and the long the more you've got the bigger hole there the wider this impact area goes so what happens as this the aquifer tries to recover and fill up again it sucks water in from all the boundaries and the boundary just gets further and further out. Colax impacted, Perigaro's impacted, Winchelsea, Dean's Marsh. This is uh, one of uh, six bore f of the bores that uh, extracts the groundwater at 500 to 600 metres down and it then uh, pumps it over to the treatment plant. The water's treated at uh, first level and then released into the Wordy Bullock in that, in that channel and uh, is gravity fed all the way to Geelong. Uh, the bores are originally at uh, four to 500 metres and uh, I'm not sure when, but they did. They, re they uh, lowered them to uh, five to 600 metres. The first serious pump was in the drought of 82, 83. Then they did a huge pump, test pump, to see how the bore field would react in uh, between 1986 and 1990 pumped out a huge amount of water put the bore field under stress then they wrote up this report a huge report and the conclusion of that report was you can pump out safely sustainably you can pump out 1500 megalitres and uh, Southern Rural Water issued a license for 12,600. Then when the license was renewed in 2004, the um, license said you can now take out 20,000 megalitres a year. In uh, June 2019, the, uh, the license comes up for renewal for the Gerangamay bore field. And uh, Yes, well we're, we're maintaining that uh, it, should, it should either be decommissioned or, well, just decommissioned. Barman Waters consultants said it could take up to 70 years for the aquifer to recover. And my, my guess would be it's more like 100 years. In rough terms, to the west, to the north, and to the east in, in rough terms up to 20 kilometre radius has been dewatered of groundwater by, by the Durango Meat bore field. They've dewatered it. Yep, they've low, lowered low. the table, they've, they've sucked the guts out of it. So, so they're obviously dewatering more and more of it, but they've dewatered it. It recovers a little bit, but even if it recovers a little bit, there's still a vast area that is still deficient of groundwater. But the hard thing is, let's, let's say you've got a bath full of water, you put a plastic cover over the top of the bath. You know how you do on swimming pools? Yeah. So you put, so you leave the plastic cover on, 
you extract water out of the bath and drop it by half then when it rains the water falls on the plastic on the top and you say it's full and look trees are growing grass is green it's full yeah. but it's not full of water because underneath the plastic the water tables or the, the bath has been half emptied until that heart until you put a few holes in the plastic and it eventually leaks down and fills the bath up again you, you've got a dried lower, lower level in your, your structure of your earth but what's stopping it going uh, what's stopping it from going into the aquifer well in the Barongarook high nothing but because it's because the bath's so bloom and empty the water just falls into the empty bath but it still doesn't fill it up You've only got a half inch pipe effectively trying to fill a, 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 a tank that requires a two inch pipe. So consequently, the half inch pipe and, and the tank's also leaky, i.e. part of the water's being pumped out of the tank quicker than it's filling up. And there lies the problem that we've got here. The, the polluted aquifer, as Malcolm described, is huge in dimensions and it is deficient of water. So effectively up to 120,000 uh, megalitres of water is required to replenish that aquifer and any one year will only in real terms provide anywhere up to one one hundredth of that in any one single year. What I was trying to point out with the, the plastic on the bath is yeah. When, when you look at this, you say, oh, well, what are you worried about? You know, yeah. when you have a look at the big swamp, you say, what are you worried about? There's trees there. That plastic on the top gives you the rain that falls. It gives you the impression that things are okay. Mm. But when you go further down into the system, it's not okay. 